So every time people are in the bankers, they're down, including the president. The president came and asked me, take me away from here. And it was so touching when the president came to me and said, Paul, take me away from here. Around uh, June, I think, we took over Bondere district. The whole of Bondere district was taken. And that relieved us. Relieved, also brought security to State House when you took Bondere. It was a bit strategic, it was a high ground. We got some tall buildings, took advantage of that. Somalis are our African brothers and sisters. When you looked at how the people were suffering, it was so painful, especially the women, the elderly. This is where you would see a problem. You said, why are they suffering? Why are they suffering? It was because it was very, very bad. You look at the children in Paris, they did nothing to eat, nowhere to sleep, always running, always dying. You said, no, this type of situation must stop. And nobody can stop it except us. On the 6th of March, 2007, the fast contingent of just 4,000 Ugandan troops arrive at Mogadishu Airport. The devastation in Mogadishu was a very, very big shock to, to us and many of our troops that, that they did not expect this to, what they saw. Every single house in Mogadishu had bullet holes, every single structure. And uh, it was like, a, a, you know, a, a deserted city, a city which had really gone to the dogs. The UPDF contingent commander is responsible for establishing their position while surrounded by the enemy. Honestly, I felt uh, it was um, a very challenging mission that had been given. Having known the history of Somalia, and of course, uh, what other forces went through when they were in Somalia. But uh, I had to plan for, prepare for it, because it had to be done. The first biggest challenge I had was, where do I put my troops? Where do I put my troops? How do I secure them? With the help of some Somalis from the traditional federal government, went around, I got a place, I said, I got a bush, I said, this is where I will be. This is my place. And this is my headquarter. It had nothing. It had only a ramshackle building. I said, this is where I will be. And that's where we started from. Part of the small area controlled by the African Union Mission to Somalia, or AMISOM, is a strategically important airport. The second day, one of our aircraft was shot. So you could see that um, the security around the airport was not good. We had uh, little men on the ground, little equipment on the ground. The logistic support was low. And uh, when the plane was hit, oh, it was like this mission impossible. It's like this mission impossible. Even securing this base alone was in itself a problem. It was a very big problem. Setting up the camp, you know, getting established here as a pioneer, pioneering a project is not easy. In December 2007, Burundi troops arrive in Mogadishu and join the Amisom mission. When the Burundians came, um, it was a great relief for us because initially it was almost a Ugandan mission. It was an African mission. So now when we saw the Burundians said, yes, now at least uh, we have a partner, we have uh, colleagues, we have uh, brothers with us here. Without the spot, we will carry it back without the spot. 
le Burundi a intervenu, a intervenu euh, en Somalie au sein de la mission de l'Union africaine parce que nous aussi, nous, avons, euh, nous sommes sentis interpellés d'agir vis-à-vis de la mission de l'Union africaine en pays frère parce qu'ils avaient des problèmes de combattre le terrorisme. Burundi aussi a été en civil war depuis 1993. Burundi a vu comment d'autres pays ont aidé helped uh, her to recover the security in Burundi. So, to respond for that, Burundi decided to go and help others African countries, especially to intervene in Somalia. The first contingent completes the role of establishing Amisom in Mogadishu and hands over to the next Ugandan battalion. When we managed to stay there for one year and saw another contingent coming, because the most important thing is us, can we manage, can we be able, we able to stay for at least one month? We saw one month going out, we saw three, we saw here, I said, yeah, we are done. This is what we wanted. This is what we wanted. The foundation has been laid, Somalia will be liberated. By early 2008, Amisom is still confined to a relatively small area of Mogadishu. Hardly three blocks were free from the Al Shabaab. And this was like a fortress where the government was. We had taken the posture of uh, real peacekeepers. Stay in the camp, don't go out, don't, uh, and, you know, even when they fire to you, um, you know, don't respond uh, uh, aggressively. Our first phase was to protect the institution. That is Force Commander One, me, the Second Force Commander, who are there to protect and preserve, protect the TFG, because that is what the old inter international community was basing itself upon. Once the TFG did not exist, then everything has poop, evaporated. Remember that we are supposed to be defensive and therefore we could not move offensive. I think uh, that sent a wrong signal, so to say, to the Al-Shabaab that you know, they could take us on. A new general arrives in Mogadishu two years after Amisom first landed. Al-Shabaab controls almost the entire city, whilst Amisom is shackled by a strictly defensive mandate. When I arrived in Somalia was in uh, July 2009. Uh, by then, uh, the Al-Shabaab had uh, launched an operation in May against Amisom. And we were now preparing to go in a, in a situation of confrontation. The Shabab was close by, you know, and they were always engaging us. 24 hours, they were engaging us. Al Shabab had entrenched themselves so, so much in the city that they're occupying every household, they're occupying every rooftop. They had sniper guns on roof of tops of, of buildings. They really, they knew Mogadishu better than us. Despite the daily attacks by Al Shabab, Amisom continues to protect the fledgling transitional federal government. But it's another year before Amisom is allowed to take preemptive action, enabling them to take offensive operations for the first time. The Al Shabaab is a difficult enemy because you know you're fighting fighting an ideology, you are fighting something which is deep in the heart of a human being. And what makes it even harder, this is a guy who feels that when he dies fighting, it's, it's honorable. The strength of Shabab in Mogadishu that time 
we estimated them between 4,000 and 5,000. But remember, these were the majority of them fighting on their own ground. But here you are, you have a force, Ugandan and Burundian force that time, that were completely new to that kind of environment. It was required that we, we, we have a force of 12,000 in Mogadishu to take over Mogadishu. But we didn't have that 12,000. If I had the 12,000, I could have conducted such operations. Go through Mogadishu one day, hit it harder, and then consolidate. But I didn't have the force levels. The force numbers were really too low. That's why I decided now to think of phase line operations. The Al Shabaab strength relies on hiding in those built up areas. And we started taking building by building, building by building. Every building was an operation of its own. We used to call it creeping operation. We said now that mobility does not help us, the best thing would be now to creep from street to street through buildings and then push them back. Because we realized that if we didn't change it, our Shabab would dominate all the surrounding places if we continue to restrict ourselves with our armored vehicles along the road. Amisim and the TFG forces begin to make gains across Mogadishu and target key enemy locations. My first operations in May was to move and capture Bakara Market. I knew what was going in Bakara. Bakara Market was the financial center of gravity of Al Shabab. That's where Al Shabab was getting much of its resources to fund the war. I didn't attack Bakara frontal. I, I first captured the stadium. The stadium was important because it was the headquarters where Al-Shabaab was launching the operation from. With the stadium under Amisim control, the force moves towards Mogadishu's commercial center. Bakara was being a commercial center and highly densely populated. I was avoiding collateral damage and also destruction of the properties of the people. And that could make us have good civil military relations with the population. And I had also talked to the business community to tell Al-Shabaab to leave Al-Bakara. Uh, if they don't, then we come in. But when we surrounded Bakara, they had no option. It took us about some three, four days to capture a distance of about uh, 400 meters. Every house, every room. You fight in a room, you find he's in another trench. He has dug a hole in a, in a house, and there, from that house, another house. Amisim and the TFG forces eventually take control of Bakara market. In a closely coordinated operation, Amisim and the TFG forces push into new areas of Mogadishu, including the important district of Bundire, which surrounds the State House. You could not sit in that State House in Mogadishu. You can't. You can't even walk in the compound because you'll be shot at. So every time people are in the bunkers, they're down, including the president. The president came and asked me, take me away from here. And it was so touching when the president came to me and said, Paul, take me away from here. Around uh, June, I think, we took over Bondere District. The whole of Bondere District was taken. And that relieved us. It relieved, it also brought security to State House when we took Bondere. It was a bit strategic, it was a high ground. We got some tall buildings, we took advantage of that. Here, when you have not controlled the corridors and the, the tall buildings, yeah. that's where the problem is. Yeah. But once you have already uh, controlled the the corridors have already constructed the escort barriers, mm -hmm. and you have entered the tall buildings, mm -hmm. then you, have, you take the day. Nobody can remove you. What we need now is not to stress ourselves in this tall thicket. We need now to either all of us combine a force and we can't we go to uh, industrial road. I told the 3rd Battalion now to fight through and occupy a uh, um, uh, steel factory, the German factory. The German factory was where they were making the IEDs. That's where they were uh, making this improvised uh, explosive device of all kinds, because there are machines there to drill, make explosives. And I knew it. I knew that's where they're operating for. Yeah, when we moved in here, as you can see, uh, we found uh, RPG shells. Uh, we, we found uh, mortar bombs. Uh, you know, they are also shells. You know use it to manufacture the IEDs and other big bombs. We are moving ahead and we think that we could find other uh, such places used by the Al-Shabaab
to manufacture such uh, bombs. I told the Burundians to move from MOD to come to cigarette factory as we are supporting them. They fought through to cigarette factory and that's how that line came in. But still, we found ourselves still in the thicket of the urban, urban area. It's a difficult job because you are, just as you know any other city, you have buildings, some are tall, some are short, and it requires a lot of manpower. And you have to be adaptive if you must make a difference in terms of winning the war. And you end up taking building by building, street by street, with all the challenges, including heavy casualties. And there was pressure that elections had to take place. But the environment was very hostile. How do you conduct an election in a country that is 95% under the Shabab and Al-Qaeda leadership. It was at this point that President Museveni, in one of the meetings that the United Nations or political office organized in Kampala of the International Contact Group, that he proposed that there should be an extension of the transitional period for one year. And in that one year, to be able to perform and accomplish some of the key transitional tasks that had not been accomplished in the previous eight years. And this was eventually to be approved in Kampala. And uh, that is where it takes the Kampala, the, the Kampala Accord name. Shortly after the Kampala Accord, Amisim soldiers, alongside the TFG army, eventually pushed Al-Shabaab out of many of Mogadishu's districts. Everybody was doubting whether that would be possible. Even the Somalis could not believe that we could liberate Mogadishu. The international community was also not believing that that was possible. When Shabaab left Mogadishu, it was a turning point on our fight against the Shabaab because we knew that from there on uh, it will be easy for us to feed them in, the, uh, in, in other areas. There were dark moments, no doubt about it. You visit the hospital, you find 10 of your people injured, you lose one or two or even more, yeah. But then again, you are motivated by the fact that you must make Somalia safe for Somalis first of all, but for the rest of the region and the stability of the continent and the world. And once you have that consolation, then tomorrow is another day, you go for an operation, another week you go for another operation. Three months following the Kampala Accord, Mogadishu is safe enough to host a meeting of key political players from right across Somalia, together with international partners. I call you to deliver tangible, meaningful resources and results. For the first time in decades, representatives of major regional administrations and religious leaders come together with a transitional federal government in a spirit of unity for peace. As the political process moves towards its deadline of elections, scheduled for the following year, Amisim's fight with Al-Shabaab continues in new areas of Somalia. While Mogadishu was the epicenter of the confusion, but that did not mean that the, you know, that was the total defeat of the Al-Shabaab. So uh, that, that, that called for finding out of Mogadishu, protect Mogadishu from out of Mogadishu, not by sitting inside Mogadishu. And that, that's why we, we had to push to areas like Balad, uh, Denle, and then eventually to Afgoi, and then to Melka, uh, so that we can free those areas. And if we free those areas, then Mogadishu becomes more safer. And if the seat of government becomes safer, then the government can function. And eventually, we can, government can also start pushing its tentacles out of the city. In May 2012, the Amisim and the TFG army advanced towards new towns, most notably Afgoi, from where Al-Shabaab launches its attacks on Mogadishu. Once again, Amisim and TFG soldiers' lives are on the line. When we finally got out of the built-up areas, that was very critical for me, because this reduced on the casualties. 
and we started to use our firepower to its full capacity. Of course, it created more momentum. To me, as a commander and the force, I commanded to even liberate more areas. Oh,